Hey guys, it's Blockchain Brad and today, once again, I'm very privileged to speak with Sam Williams. He is the CEO and co-founder of Arweave. Sam, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, it's great to be back. Likewise, mate. And obviously there's so much to get through in this update. It's designed specifically to really elicit what Arweave has been doing of late with regard to their tech and also with regard to everything that's, that, that's followed on from their live release. They are active, they are in the system, and they he, are here for the long term. So Sam, let's start with uh, yourself for one moment. We won't spend too much time on it, but obviously you stopped your PhD. Uh, you were a candidate, you, you went full time in this. How is it going? How has this all played out? And are you glad you made that switch in Tarweave? Well, first, we had a problem we wanted to solve, and then we kind of built some technology that we could solve that problem. We wrote a white paper about it, and we got on with building it. And when we were building it, we sort of expanded what it was that we, we created. And, and when it came time for the launch of the network and, and the sales slightly before it, um, yeah, we, we only had time to write a small white paper. Uh, so actually, I got back in touch with my PhD uh, supervisor not long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I, I got permission to change the subject of my PhD to Arweave itself. So now, while I was going to be writing up this yellow paper anyway, it will just be a PhD thesis, which is really great for the project because it means that um, we'll actually have serious, academic, rigorous uh, sort of validation and, and uh, argumentation around the core of the system, which is something you really don't get very often in blockchain projects. There's always like, you know, you get best pace of a yellow paper that's had no academic review, no, no peer study at all. Right. Uh, whereas this would be like a really rigorously um, challenged document. So, so I'm pretty excited about that. It could actually <laughs> be a world first, Sam, in that respect. Sorry to interrupt, but it could be a world first with regard to the kind of rigor you're talking about. I haven't actually heard of a PhD conducted with particularly a live uh, existent um, blockchain endeavor like yours. So it's going to be an interesting read. I'll certainly look forward to you sending that email. But let's now talk about essentially what the Arweave uh, system is about. Obviously, data and permanence are really fundamental to your core design. But for those who don't know, just quickly give us a bit of an introduction into it so we can really go into the update. Yeah, of course. So Arweave is basically a permanent information storage system that scales. Uh, it's kind of like a blockchain. Blockchains give you this data replication across all the nodes in the system and consensus about what the data in the network is and cryptographic kind of entanglement of bits of data with other bits of data. The, the problem with it is that it just doesn't scale to uh, giving those properties to large amounts of data because everyone in the network has to have all of the data and you're not actually rewarded for the data you store. Uh, this means that like the, the Ethereum and Bitcoin blockchains, they're hundreds of gigabytes now. Um, so what we've done is we've changed it with the system that we call BlockWeave. And the, the starting point of that is making it so that you only need one block in order to join the network. The whole state of the network is memoized into a single block. And then for every subsequent block that you hold, you're rewarded. Uh, and so here we kind of take away that, that hashing power reward that you normally get, which is essentially just burning electricity, getting random numbers. Um, and we, we channel some of that towards the storage of data for the long term. Um, yeah, right. so this is a... Well, Sam, in that respect, let's talk about that for a moment. You've basically alluded to uh, advancements made, or advances rather, made from the original iterations. So let's talk about that for a moment. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting that really the imperative for becoming something of real use requires this kind of means of really allowing for more efficient means, making sure, as you said, you've really developed from that original blockchain design into something of the block weave. Is this what is required for real-world adoption? I don't know if it's going to be required for real-world adoption, but I think we have a moral imperative to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we've done is we've, we've taken the consensus mechanism, which itself was a very, it's, it's necessarily value expending, that's fine. But the problem was that the value that was being expended was in, in, a, in an area that was just making the planet worse, fundamentally. So right. we, we Taken that, it was basically a competition, right? You, all you need in these networks is a kind of competition between machines uh, where the output can be very easily verified. So what you're doing with randomly guessing these numbers is uh, you're trying to find a number that makes a certain property whole, mathematical property. Uh, and then other people can check that, that very, very quickly. So it's very hard to find, very easy to check. That's the fundamental property uh, right. that's required for systems. And we've just made it so that, okay, it's actually the storage of data and then the checking that each other is storing the data that, that has that, um, that fulfills that role in the system. 
And right. so, yeah, I, I don't think it's really required, but, but I think we should be doing it. And I think right. actually consensus mechanisms that have a positive outcome, like ours does, uh, we'll, we'll be seeing more of those for sure. Yes, and I do want to talk to you about that with regard to productivity, because, and that's something I assume will become relevant, actually, as we move forward. Because, again, the alignment of productivity, efficiency, and the original iterations just aren't there. You know, and for, from an enterprise perspective, for example, or for more of that examples of genuine use case for perhaps business. Again, when we see these new waves of uh, blockchain and DLT designs come forth, we're seeing improvements uh, and a greater, more attractive means for, again, that, that integration into the wider sphere of, of not just business, but even just, you know, the, the applications for all of us as consumers and users. You're in that, you know, new wave, clearly. Let's talk about that with regard to data, though, Sam, because one of the things you talk about as a buzzword is this permanence, this ability to really store data uh, in, in for an infinite amount of time. Why is that so important? And how are you going to get people to make that switch? Why would they care? So there's a couple of questions there, I guess. Okay, so, so why you should care is that uh, this is actually something that humans have been attempting to do for a very long period of time. Uh, when you walk around in the world, you'll see things carved into stone all over the place, whether it be gravestones, plaques, uh, signposts sometimes. These are all attempts that humans have made to encode a piece of data permanently. The problem is that the, the, the physical world just doesn't really react very well to that. We don't have mechanisms of permanent information storage yet. Well, we didn't until, until the R-Weave came along. And that, I guess, was the, <laughs> the, the uh, problem that we were trying to solve. So when people make archives or, or libraries, these are attempts to make systems that'll make it so that we can come back and access a piece of information in 10, 50, 100 years time. Um, and we've been, yeah, we've just been doing this in the analog world for, for so long. Uh, but in the digital world, we we haven't really attempted it yet. And I think what blockchain gave us was the start, the kind of um, seed. Right? And with our, we've, we've tried to grow that into, into an actual tree where you can uh, yeah, use it for real, normal stuff. So as well as you know, some of the stuff we put on there is uh, evidence of Nazi war crimes, for example, stuff that humanity really shouldn't forget. Uh, but you can also use it for storing contracts. You know, it's actually very cheap. It's very simple. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, the data sphere really splits into two halves. There's stuff that should be ephemeral and stuff that should be permanent. So sure. your conversations with your spouse, say, right, mm -hmm. they, they right. should probably be ephemeral. They, they're things that are private, they're between you and another person, and they're, they're a short period of learning. you're expressing something that, that should be sort of forgotten fairly reasonably. And that, right. that's, that's fine, that, that covers a, a very large area of the information space that's been exceptionally well covered with information technology so far. But what we've done is looked at the other side, which is not very well covered at all, which is information with, I'm really just trying to make sure that I can come back to this at any point in the future. And we didn't really, we haven't yet until, until how we built information technology in this sphere before. Right. So, well, yes. Sam, Sam, just interrupt. So you're talking about the transience of information as a given right now. Can you explain to us uh, how that's evidenced? in the way in which data is recorded. So people can really understand. We see the use case, for example, of you know, going to get access information, store information uh, via you know, mainstream means right now. Uh, what are they and why are they actually transient? Can you explain to us how that is so? Well, I guess it's because by default, everything is transient, right? Hmm. So uh, unless we make an, a concerted effort, and actually we think that the, the, the key is in designing incentives correctly. That's the part that you couldn't really do before decentralized incentive networks came along. Right, but Sam, in this respect, is there nothing that's centralized by design that is, uh, again, that permanent structure of data, data storage? Well, I mean, Probably. these places that are, that are centralized stores uh, have shown time and time again not to be good, um, it, not to be good enough fundamentally for mm -hmm. permanent storage. You can't have a centralized structure that does this. And a simple example is everybody assumes, okay, uh, major national archives. There, there was a, um, a, a library in Birmingham where I, where I grew up uh, that housed you know, works from all over the world. It was, um, it was thought to be permanent by the people that lived there until one day it just burnt down. 
And that was it. All that information was gone. Right. Uh, the Internet Archive had a fire at one of their warehouses recently. I mean, luckily, not very much was lost, but, but even so, the, these things happen when you have a centralized system. So, so the key, as far as we can tell, is to build a network that is decentralized and encourages replications. And, and since we last spoke, one of the really, really exciting things we've seen is that um, the miners in the network are desperate to get their hands on more of the data so that they can be more efficient miners. And, right. and when this was happening, we were thinking, oh, okay, well, how do we design systems that gets the data to the miners faster? And, and then a few weeks later, we looked back on it and like, wow, actually, no, this is the incentive network working perfectly. What these miners have done as a result of the way we've engineered the system is, um, yeah, optimize for getting as many replications of the data as possible. And so I think actually our we now represents the highest data replication um, storage system in the world. As far as I'm aware, nothing has as close to the number of replications we have. Right. Well, you certainly sold me on the need for, again, having a model in which is that, that permanent and replicated store of, of data. And I think that was the key, is understanding that you can actually duplicate that. And it's not just a one source position being distributed. That's going to be an asset for a multitude of different applications. And I'm hoping to learn more about some examples of that from you later. But Sam, if we could now talk about, again, some of the advantages. You know, very specifically, I've written down a few, perhaps just sort of start the conversation, globally distributed. Uh, obviously, the cryptographic hash ensures a strong sense of security. Um, again, you're focused on this immutable design. So what fundamentally, aside from that permanent sort of point of value, would you argue is the, the core assets and features that um, represent the advantages for block, the block weave? So one of the things I think that's really cool is that it's a storage network that cuts out the middleman completely. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as if the network itself is running as a business and because the computers don't really care about making a profit themselves, only the miners, um, then we can cut out that, that cost of having a, a, a sort of a connection between the person or the thing that wants storing and the available storage in the network. So the storage is exceptionally cheap comparatively uh, and, and of course it, it just lasts indefinitely. We, you can do things with these kinds of networks, but you could never administrate properly with a, a normal business. So for example, we have a system of pooled rewards. So you pay, say, um, a few R to store a few megabytes of data. You put it onto the block wheel. Um, you put the reward into a pool, and because the system can split tokens into it's like 12 decimal places, mm -hmm. we can eke out that reward to remind us over essentially not quite an indefinite period, but pretty close for hundreds of years. Um, and this is just something that you could never administrate inside a normal business. Uh, right. So that's one of the major advantages you get with a decentralized incentive network like are we? Uh, I see. But I think, yeah. So obviously, so that, and that incentivization, that really is unique to each for these distributed systems that we're seeing emerge now. Uh, often the case, you know, is put forward of why the token. Obviously, that's an imperative discussion. Let's just have that for a moment. Now, mm -hmm. you've tokenized your model as well as part of this. Is that an essential criterion for, uh, you know, having that synergistic um, mining and incentivization mechanism? Yeah, so for us, um, the, the positive sort of utility is created through the consensus mechanism itself, which means that in order to reward people for it, you have to have the token inside, uh, yeah, inside the incentive mechanism. It, it wouldn't function correctly outside it, or inside the consensus mechanism rather. Um, and so subsequently you couldn't use visa payments or something like this. Unfortunately, because that would actually be nicer in some sense. Right. It, it would be able to uh, reach a wider audience faster. Although actually, on this topic, we've been thinking a lot about how we get people into the system quickly. Mm -hmm. And so we've been looking at Ripple's interledger system and uh, yeah, integrating with that so that you can essentially create these kind of pipes. So they have, say, a, a Fiat Ripple pipe. And then if we create a, a Ripple R pipe, then you can kind of feed to uh, money into tokens that are then used for storage directly. And the user does, isn't even aware of the token in the system. Right, and that's really interesting that you're saying you're talking with about that because right now some of the best uh, projects are literally trying to redress and reconsider their tokenomics, especially given that there's so much speculation inherent in the way in which these utility tokens are treated in the common 
the, the, the current market as well, Sam. So clearly you want to really ensure the, the, and protect the utility by design. Uh, and also yeah. that, that kind of relationship with fee, it's going to be crucial as you build out for the real world. Yes, precisely. Yeah, I think um, what you're saying about the, the, the speculative element, of it, it, I, I totally agree. It's, it's, it's very um, dangerous for the space, really. Right. I think. It's almost um, paradoxical, too, because in the current state, you know, despite the fact that you are a live network, and we'll talk about the value of that, but again, it doesn't preclude people because it's on exchange or to be on exchanges essentially in the future. Uh, this kind of process allows for this, you know, treatment of a security, you know, whilst you are by design that utility and fundamentally so it's not necessarily the position of all participants in the future when they can access your token, they're not necessarily going to treat it that way. And that's the paradox that we often see. Yeah. I mean, so we built, sort of protections against potential speculative bubbles into the network itself way back at the beginning. Okay. The way that pricing works is um, pricing for uh, storage, that is, is essentially based on, um, well, it's about five layers of indirection, but it's also related to the cost of the token itself uh, mm -hmm. by, by proxy of proxy of proxy. Uh, and what this means is that if the token price rises very high, for example, um, then the price of storage doesn't increase dramatically too, which is something that we've seen that's really, really stifled other projects. So when the price of, um, say we had a smart contract system uh, and we had a set price, it was 10, you know, whatever your base unit per reduction that's done in the system, per computation. Uh, then if the price of your token rises, then so does the price of your utility that you're offering. And this makes the utility yes useful for people. It's less competitive in the marketplace. Right. So this is a really major, major problem. So we've tried to make it so that these speculative um, agents, yeah, yeah, speculative agents don't don't affect the, the core utility. That's so interesting, Sam. Because essentially, what I've always argued from the outset is that these that the functionality of the token itself is almost like a voucher equation for a currency. And I don't use that term lightly because I know a lot of people don't like it. But essentially, that's what it is because it is an instrument of value. And so it needs to be relatively stable. And that's what you're suggesting is that you put a mechanism in place to trust it, to be able to utilize it the way it was intended. And that is exciting to hear because again, it's not pegged to that big speculative component that we see or at the moment. So yeah, that's I, I think the, the, the biggest instance of this, this really caught my eye um, was in EOS. You can, um, you can uh, trade RAM, right? So it's mm -hmm. a, the network has a certain amount of resources and you can, you can buy and, and sell the components that you need in order to run a program for a certain period of time. And, and RAM, for a moment, was one of these things that people were speculating on. And it, and it, was, um, it, was, it was really crazy. <laughs> and you saw the way that it was affecting the system was just making it hard for people to actually use it. Right. And that's difficult to see. So, right. so I'm, I'm quite sure that we, we baked in this, this system that, that detaches the cost of the utility uh, from the cost of the token right right into the core network itself. I, I think you should be talking to other projects about that, Sam. It's going to be something popular, that idea of separation. But let's now talk about some of the key features of your design with regard to the tech. Now, you have a very interesting component and in, in, in built inside your the, 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 the R-Weave design. That is BlockWeave. And then you also have Wildfire as well. Let's talk about those in detail so that people can understand. Let's start first with Wildfire. Really interesting because you're able to essentially optimize through this technology, really allow for people, for, for miners also to benefit through an incentivized mechanism or an algorithm. Talk us through what it is and why it really matters. Yeah, so Wildfire is a, an incentivized network topology. So that is, it's an incentivized way of organizing a network to efficiently distribute data to other people. And, and at, at its core, which is nice, it's extremely simple to explain. Simply, if you give me data, I will give you data. The faster you give me data, the faster I give you data. And that, that's basically it. But when you push it out onto a decentralized network and, and you look at the, um, the emergent effects of that kind of behavior, and what's great is since, since we last spoke, we can actually see this in practice now. Right. Um, it, it builds this efficient network of distribution of data around the world. Uh, so, for example, if I'm talking to a node, so I'm, I'm in Berlin at the moment, if I'm talking to a node in Paris, 
uh, that's, a, that's a very high uh, throughput connection and it's very low latency. So if I'm sending only um, a few kilobytes, then I can get it to Paris very, very quickly. And so the node in Paris likes me because I've got it useful data fast. So it, it prioritizes me for distribution in the future. But unfortunately, Brad, you're, you're in Australia. And right. so if in Paris tries to send data to you, then it's gonna take a very long time. Uh, so that, that connection in the network will be deprioritized. And, and what will happen instead is that the node in Paris, if it's got some new block to distribute, for example, uh, will send the data to me, and then I'll send it to someone perhaps in Russia, and they'll send it to someone in China, and then they'll send it to someone in Indonesia, and then they'll finally send it to you. But they've created a, an efficient path of the data distribution uh, through the world. And what's really cool is we can now actually see this in practice working. And there, there was a period where the, um, the number of miners in the network grew by about fourfold in, uh, in about four weeks or something like this. So, so that was a period where data distribution in the network was pretty stretched. And sure enough, we saw that the people that uh, were giving high quality network connections were having a better experience of it. And those that were using you know, a small laptop on a Wi-Fi connection to a residential line to somewhere that was really far away from anywhere else that, that had high connectivity, they were having a harder time downloading the data. And so, yeah, yeah, it, it's well, what's ex What's really work. exciting about that, Sam, is that you're, there's a provability aspect or there's, a, there's, there's proof now. It's no longer just yeah. that theory that we initially spoke about, hoping that this would unfold. You actually can show it. And most importantly is that that optimization uh, built in is really affording for people like me in Australia to be able to communicate, uh, you know, in that respect and with regard to data in a very seamless way, which couldn't be done without wildfire. But if we could talk now a little bit more about minimalism, I really want to go there with regard to data. You want to strip things bare, and that's what this new wave of design in your architecture is trying to do. Talk us through what that's about and why that matters. No, that's precisely right. I mean, so the problem with blockchains is that well, it's almost like we're in 1970 and the first IBM machines have come out. Mm -hmm. the, the size of like, you know, houses. Um, and, and they do lots of stuff that's very inefficient. But, but ours is a truly long-term project. We want the R-Weave to be running in 100 years' time, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, and in order to do that, we've got to make sure that the, the fundamentals of the system are as, as optimally small as possible. They, they achieve the largest amount with the smallest amount of overhead and, and bloat. Uh, so, yeah, since, since we last spoke, since the launch. So, I think we spoke a few weeks before the launch of the network. Last yes, time. we did. So, so, the first version of the network was uh, secure and stable, and it, it worked well enough. But since then, we've been doing a huge amount of improvements to it that, that remove these kind of, um, yeah, anything unnecessary at all, really. Mm -hmm. Making it so verification of blocks is almost instant. You know, it's, um, it's what we call in, in computer science, big O one. So, so the complexity of it is constant time. It doesn't matter about the contents of it, whatever is inside, it's just big O1. Right. Um, where previously it was highly complex. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so we've also been stripping away the amount of data that you have to store in all parts of the network. Uh, so we, we're making it so that uh, wallet lists, the state of the, all of the wallets in the network, uh, you can just forget about them if you want to, after 50 blocks, for example. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, we're, we've released, um, I think it's about, 150% of the initial size of the Arweave code base, again, since launch. Um, yeah, and so it's been really exciting to see it all unfold. And we're right. just in the moment now of getting what we call Blockweave 2.0. Um, right, because I yeah. think at some stage you had a 1.6 and you're moving to 2.0. You're clearly there now. What's really interesting too is that, you know, you, you, you are well known in the space for being highly technological, but ironically, it really is about pulling this apart. It's about stripping this bare so that you get that high throughput. You really maximize through this minimalist approach. Uh, do you anticipate more of this in the future? Or is this something of a standard that you think you can then retain and really just work on? So for Blockweave 2.0, I think um, we're trying to get it down to what we see as the minimal block, the, the optimal construction in terms of data structure that, that we can create. Um, what we're going to be looking at after that is uh, increasing the write speed of the network. So at the moment, the, the read speed of the network is, I think we worked it out the other day, it's, it's nearly a gigabyte per second, something like this. It's extremely fast to read from this thing. Uh, but the write speed is a lot slower, and, and part of that is the consensus. Everybody has to have access to all the data at some point. Uh, so making it so that that is, is optional, 
yeah, is, is what's on the agenda afterwards. Right. Now, your proof of access, I want to talk about that as well, because you draw on old data. You have a randomized verification process as well to select that new data. Why is this proof of access so important? Again, when we talk about things just beyond the narrative of efficiency and, and productivity, surely there's other reasons. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it proves that there is access to that data possible at some time. And so when the block weave gets very large, you know, 100 years down the line, uh, it's going to be important that at some point we just randomly poll and check that we have access to the old data. And that's exactly what proof of access does. And, and a really cool part of that is it doesn't just prove that access is possible to the data in the network. It also forces redistribution of that data around the network. And so this means it's essentially a new opportunity for people to um, make another copy, increase the number of redundant copies in the network of this old data. Yeah, so, so it's, it's pretty neat in that sense. Right, and then give us a, a use case example, Sam. Say we're in a museum, like you said, or we're trying to record some sort of, or archive, archive some sort of key data, and then perhaps I distribute that to you in the other part of the world. Give us an example of that and how that will work. Yeah, so one of the things we built is a, is a censorship-resistant internet archive uh, data gateway. Mm -hmm. And essentially what we did here is we got uh, information that was stored in, uh, in the internet archives sort of, where they have this very strange building. I visited not, not long ago, but it's okay. another story. <laughs> okay. They have all this interesting data. Uh, we were particularly interested in their, their Nazi war crime documentation. Mm -hmm. so, so we got copies of this and we, we put it onto the RW and now uh, we made a kind of index page. And because the RW uses web technologies from the top to the bottom, um, you can just point a web browser at this web page and it'll, it'll show you the list of all of these documents and you can click around and you can browse and you can see these Nazi war crime evidence documents that the CIA collected. Mm -hmm. um, it, and what's really important is that that access is censorship resistant. So, so I did a demo of this in San Francisco. And it, to kind of illustrate this point, I, I accessed it through a VPN um, that was inside Turkey, right, where internet access is, is pretty highly restricted. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you have access to one of the nodes in the network, as long as you can talk to one peer, you'll be able to get access to all of the data in the system. And this means that, um, yeah, things you might find in the museum, uh, vitally important human lessons will be right. forgotten. Right, now that sounds exciting, but Sam, on that, in that respect, is there any dangers inherent in that kind of access, considering that hacking is something that would be a concern for current centralized systems who want to protect it in that way, even though it is not necessarily permanent for the future? Can you see some of those concerns? Yeah, so this goes back to what I was saying about the, the ephemeral type of data, or the type of data that should be ephemeral, and the type right. of data that should be permanent. They are very right. different. And okay. in order to govern the system, um, yeah, we've created what we call the democratic content policy. Mm -hmm. And so this is a mechanism that um, allows miners to essentially vote on what they believe should or should not be in the system, or simply what should or should not be ephemeral. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so in this way, miners can express an opinion, and, and they can also, um, well, it works from a system of voluntarism, right? So they express an opinion about what should or shouldn't be in the network. And then if they're voted against, they can still decide, okay, well, I'm not going to have any part in uh, storing this piece of data. And so afterwards, say, you know, 51% of people vote for a piece of data to be entered into the system, but in 10, 20 years' time, 90% of people decide that access to that data shouldn't be allowed, then 90% of people just don't store the data. And that means that it's you know, approximately 90% harder for the person to find the data and get access to it. So it's simply a case of whether well, it just slows down the process. And yes, yeah, so this is how we, we govern that, that system of um, information control without having a single party that decides what should or should not be in the system. So that's obviously something that we're... Right, so, so clearly the nodes are, are in, intensifying, or the number is really increasing uh, very rapidly in your ecosystem. And what you're saying is that whilst the, there is that um, immutability and that permanence forever built in, there is still an, a, a means in which data can be hidden by design because of the democracy of your system. And I think that's important to know because that affords people a bit more trust when some there's anomalies perhaps that happen and there's information that is uh, permanently stored <laughs> through your system, but perhaps not necessarily something what everyone wants to advocate for as being at the forefront of access or you know, being able to, to easily access. Yeah, and then it's simply a case of uh, 
who decides to do it. And people are just mm. voting with their, with their opinions. Right. And I think um, the, the only way to, to govern such a system, the, the only alternative is to have, you know, one guy or a collection of people that decide what should or should not be allowed to be um, said. And mm. well, so, and so, so sorry to interrupt, Sam, but in that context, do you anticipate that there'll be centralized systems in parallel with your very robust global system that you're trying to build now? Do you anticipate there'll still be mechanisms that are centralized for those, uh, as you mentioned before, those ephemeral needs? Yeah, certainly. I think actually, Ephemeral data storage, so the situation we have at the moment, right, seems to be that as soon as a piece of data, uh, I type it into my computer or it, or it hits a line, you know, it gets onto some sort of a, a transfer medium that I don't control, uh -huh. then, then I can't know that it will be stored forever. And I also can't know that it'll be lost, right? <laughs> it's basically right. out of control and it's kind of arbitrary which way it falls. Right. Um, yeah, and so I think the, the ephemeral side of things, we still haven't got truly ephemeral data transmission working yet. Mm -hmm. We've made progress with the R-Weave on, on making things truly permanent. Uh, most, most information, almost all information, exists in this uh, kind of limbo in the middle where it may or may not be stored, um, mm -hmm. but we can't really tell. And, and this goes for your, you know, your, um, your WhatsApp with your spouse or whatever. This right. is not a system which is... Um, truly ephemeral. And so I actually think there's a lot of work that should be done in that area, which is funny because of course I spent much of my life thinking about how to make information permanent, <laughs> but, but I also think that there's parallel work that needs to be done in the ephemeral zone. And I, and I don't envy the people doing it. I think it's I, I, I think it's fascinating to hear some of the, the potential of this though, Sam. I mean, obviously there are so many different verticals we could discuss in how this could be truly beneficial. I'm just thinking, having done law at university, there's so, such immense potential for, from the legal sort of uh, vertical with regard to trying to access data, say in 100 years as we discussed, that could be really um, crime solving. You know, there could be really genuine reasons why having access to, to that kind of permanent data storage facility can really benefit the real world for this kind of, um, I guess, forensic research. Just as one Absolutely. example. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking to some people that are involved in open source journalistic investigations uh, mm. for use of that system in, in those kind of areas, but also for lawyers and solicitors uh, who have to go around and they, they have to, um, I was going to say archive web pages, but having spoken to them, I realized well, what they're actually doing is taking screenshots of web pages. Right. And they just put them on their hard drives and then using this as evidence in court. And um, yeah, so we're going to be, be uh, making advances in both of those areas, I think. Right. Based on, um, yeah. Well, it's exciting. Archive. It's really exciting to hear how this is building out. And on, in that context, the main net is live. What's kind of interesting about this is that we've built a very deep technology. And we see ourselves as somewhere on the spectrum between startup and open source project. So we're trying to position ourselves such that, that people can use the software to build uh, their own applications on top of rather than us going out and building every application. Uh -huh. um, yeah, from scratch. And so that, that means growth is this kind of interesting thing about just nurturing other people's products that are built using our platform. Right. Yes, yeah, yeah, so it's going well. It's like, so that, so as, you uh, said, so, as you said, yeah. Sam, you're a platform. Let's mm -hmm. talk about now the development on that. We call them dApps or you know, distributed or decentralized applications. Let's talk about the kind of conversations and growth that only the CEO could possibly know with just how your platform's being utilized to benefit with someone else's project. Yeah, so our dApps are kind of different and mm -hmm. interesting. They're, right. they're really just web applications. So okay. one of the things we've been thinking about a lot since the launch, we, we had a hard time at the beginning positioning ourselves. We, we thought, well, okay, it's, it's a global permanent hard drive. Yeah. I mean, that, that's true. But what it is more specifically is a global permanent web. And, and so we've come up with this concept that we call the perma web, which is basically this new kind of web um, that, that is served from the RV itself so that all the content on the perma web is permanent uh, and none of the links ever break between it. It's always available and you can view it on your, on your mobile, on your desktop, wherever. And right. uh, as long as you have the web extension installed, you can do it in a decentralized way. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're actually just about to get ready to launch this Perma Web initiative, where we're planning to get people to, um, yeah, put their simple web applications written in JavaScript, HTML, CSS, 
uh, onto our system as a form of web hosting. And we see this not so much as the, the traditional DAP that's like a kind of very specific uh, smart contract that does one part of a, a product essentially and then there's stuff built on top. If you think about crypto kitties, it's like the, the DAP part of that, the smart right. contract was really just this um, storage of, of mutations of random data. And then they had the bit where you have um, JPEGs and you know, like graphics to see what kind of kitty or you know, that kind of stuff on top of it elsewhere. But what we're looking at is actually these apps are way simpler. Almost 10%, something like that, of the US population could already write an Are We Homer Web app today. We use this just for simple storage and serving of web applications. Um, and that's really exciting because the, so it sounds a bit like left field, I think. But it does. <laughs> but, but I like it. I like the, it in the sense the, that you're expanding your own, uh, I, I, I guess, determination or your own uh, definition, because I, everyone knows you mm -hmm. as that uh, permanent data solution uh, in a decentralized mm -hmm. frame. But as soon as you add this layer into it, you you morph into something more. Yeah. So we still have our focus on the long term of building this global permanent archive of human knowledge and history. But we see in the shorter term, there's actually this very clear opportunity. The people uh, that build web applications, they don't like the fact that they have to commission a, a server, which they pay for on a monthly basis, even an hourly basis from Amazon. They have to do upkeep on the system. They have to make sure that there are uh, hacks of it and so on. Whereas actually what they want most of the time is a simple way of serving um, about a megabyte of text and images. And we can offer people that for a very, very low cost, and it's trivial to deploy onto the system. And then you just change your domain name so that it points to the Arweave, and there you go. It works right. perfectly. So is that already operational now, and is the interface really seamless and easy for people to use in the, in the test phase that you've obviously done? Yeah, so this is the thing. Uh, all of the, the framework works very nicely, but what we spent a lot of the, the last few months working on is uh, making it so that it's easier to put data onto the system. And, and our goal is to make it so that it's the easiest web application deployment system in the world. And I think by end of Q1, we're probably going to be there. Uh, Sam, we're, that's we're a big deal. You know, we're talking about the largest in the world. This is, I wasn't expecting to have this conversation so soon. Uh, given if, if everything plays out according to your roadmap, uh, is this going to facilitate the revenue for your own ecosystem, for your own um, Team, so because you mentioned there'll be a small fee involved, is that really going to help facilitate uh, your endeavour to become this, you know, this global um, system for data storage? Yeah. Um, not us directly. People will need to buy the token in the network, uh, and in order to do that, they you know, various mechanisms. But yeah, so so it, it increases demand for the token because it increases demand for storage at a mm -hmm. really basic level. Um, right. But I think that's important to recognize is because, again, you're finding another way to incentivize participation in your ecosystem because of this additional feature. Yeah, completely. I mean, we're totally focused. We're, we're a seriously decentralized project. Uh -huh. uh, we see ourselves as kind of this, this open source maker of a piece of software, and then our role is to onboard people onto it, rather than there's a lot of these kind of blockchain projects that are really mostly centralized and it's about increasing the balance sheet of the company. Like, right. Yeah. So they, they, so they, so they, yeah. Like, we really care about our balance sheet. We care about the, the state of the ecosystem. And I think that there are some actors out there and some uh, architects such as Vitalik who do uphold the same sort of vision, or the decentralized vision. But in that respect, I did really want to address the question of whether or not you think that the main, the, the, the lay person, or the masses really valorize this kind of ideal of decentralization when it comes to utilizing something like this. Because often there's, we need a, a greater carrot than just the ideal itself so that people can just simply use it, perhaps not even know about the, the ideal and just you know, experience it by default. But um, it, for what do you think about that, Sam? Do you think that it's gonna be easy to, make, to encourage people to make that switch beyond well, decentralization as a narrative? I, I think you're 100% right. This is something that people miss all the time, is that decentralization is often kind of an incremental improvement on what previously existed. Mm -hmm. So we need to offer people something that is better than what they have already. And going back to, for example, this web application hosting plan, they, they're going to have to pay large amounts of money for an indefinite period, and they're going to have to perform upkeep on this website. 
or they use our system, they, they deploy it, like I was saying, it's the fastest deployment mechanism for a web application in existence by the end of Q1, we think. Mm -hmm. um, it, it offers them something they can't get elsewhere, and it solves their problem. I, I don't think there's enough focus on that in the space. I totally agree, and I think your payment web is actually the core asset for making this transition and this appeal more relevant for users because it's a bridge. It's an educational bridge and also an experiential one because people can do something for real for their own benefit, which we all like. We're all a little bit egocentric in that respect, but then it's going to lead to the outcome of understanding and educating themselves as to why this framework could be actually beneficial for the long term for them. So it's really interesting that you're building this in and again, possibly imperative. Uh, let's talk now about the interface with regard to its simplicity, its access and ease of interface. Just talk us through what you know, that, Sam, as the CEO with regard to this um, the, these platform you know, layers that you've built in for people to start using when it's ready. Yeah, so, so this is all about access mechanisms. The interesting thing about the Perma web idea is that we didn't change anything about the underlying software at all. It, it already did this. It's simply a case of, of giving people the, the tools they need in order to deploy, in this case, a web application. But it could be just uh, storing a website that already exists or something like this, giving people the on-ramps for the storage of data. Um, yeah, and so I think that's a really important thing that we'll be building out over the next few years. Really, it'll take a while. My guess is how it's going to progress is like this. We're going to try a whole bunch of different things. Uh, some of them will be very successful. Some will be less successful. And, and our job will simply be to focus in on the ones that are successful in, in the short to medium term and get usage and adoption of the system like that. And you know, furthering the long-term goal, also start to fill the weave with valuable information. And then in doing this, people are exposed to the Arweave ecosystem. Uh, and then they start to see the you know, Arweave powered by Arweave logo elsewhere. And, and it starts to become a bigger thing. And then, yeah, we can move into other areas as well. Right. Well, Sam, I'm going to ask you some really direct questions with regard to money now. One of them is enterprise. It's one of my favorite topics. I really believe that the next wave of relevance is going to integrate uh, institutions or in enterprises into the distributed ledger technology. So with that respect, how as a very public oriented and open source system, are you going to integrate these private verticals and how are they going to interact potentially with our weave? Well, so one of the things that we've been working on for nearly a year now um, is this, what we call the aerospace project. I don't think it actually has a name yet, but, but there's a few people from the aerospace industry, very experienced, uh, and they've been looking at this idea of aircraft leasing, right? So when you lease an aircraft, at the moment what happens is you transfer a massive number of boxes with a whole bunch of documents in them uh, about all of the maintenance that ha that's happened on that aircraft. Of course, if you lease an aircraft, you're responsible um, for its quality uh, when, when you get it back and subsequently if there's, there's problems with the maintenance then that's on you. So you need to do due diligence on it and this costs around $100,000 per aircraft transfer. There's a fleet of 20,000 um, aircraft that are leased worldwide uh, per year and so if you multiply that it's actually a fairly big uh, sector. But of course, so basically they want to use the Arweave as a permanent data storage system. You can then uh, verify the maintenance logs up to a certain point and you say okay i've verified this and then when you get the, the, the aircraft back in the future you only have to verify the data after that sounds silly but it's hugely hugely uh beneficial in terms of increased efficiency so they think that they can cut this aircraft leasing cost down to ten thousand dollars rather than a hundred thousand right so if we okay. if we do okay so go ahead Sam. Is, sorry i just want to this is a private kind of thing, right? They don't want all those data to be public. So what we're working with them to do is build a private Arweave instance that submits the hashes of each of the blocks onto the public Arweave. So you get the same uh, verifiability with all of the hashing power and the, the uh, proof of access power and strength of the Arweave network, but applied to essentially a kind of sub Arweave network. And so this wow. is something that, we, that the enterprise space is going to be yeah, looking at more. And Sam, we haven't talked about this, and this is exciting. Having talked to so many uh, almost synergistic or, or dual operational uh, designs whereby there is a permissioned aspect and there is a permissionless, you'd know of them as well. One of the interesting things that comes up is these terms of hybridization and customizability. That's mm -hmm. what you're talking about here, that latter part of customizing the needs of these private verticals and sectors and businesses, in fact. So is it your 
sort of beyond supposition is it your expectation rather that this is going to be commonplace this kind of ability to have these sub designs customizable for the needs of these closed source systems that can still access your open source um, platform so i think broadly yes but what we're going to have to do is make sure that they feed back into the central ecosystem still uh, because i personally think that the permissioned blockchains that are just totally, totally private and nobody, nobody else takes part in them and has visibility of them, they don't offer a fantastic amount um, because they can still be modified. They don't have the safety in numbers uh, that decentralization gives you. Right. So I think we really are looking at building networks of networks of, of block weaves and, and that'll be the way that, that it gets into those enterprise sectors. But and, still and very, actually, very interesting though that you're already considering and having discussions with those who are presenting a need. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I think in 15 years' time, it'll be commonplace in enterprises. But there's just so much that needs to be done before mm. we get to that. Well, Sam, let's talk about for a moment, we, we talk about proof of work too much, I think, mm. in this space. Now we have so many different mechanisms beyond it. But proof it works with regard to the revenue, proof of revenue. Is that something that's even relevant given that you're open source? Are you going to need to develop sort of some sort of streams of revenue beyond the raise that you've had? Once that runs out, have you got mechanisms so, to make money? <laughs> so we sold a, a smaller portion of our token supply, it, partially because, well, I, as the CEO, didn't really want to sell that much of it because <laughs> I thought the worst possible time to sell something is before you've launched it and shown its value to people. Right. So we still have quite a large portion of the token supply, uh, but it's vested over, uh, over a few years, five years. Um, people you know comfortable with the tokenomics essentially uh, yeah and so so essentially when it gets further down the line uh, and we need some more funding then we'll sell a few of the tokens that we hold and this also keeps us in line our incentives in line with the token holders I think what often happens with these systems is you know people sell 90% of the token supply up front and then they're like well okay how are we gonna make money in the future Which is a reasonable enough question and they, they have to deviate from the of the people in the community and the people that hold the tokens. Mm -hmm. uh, I really don't like that system. I, I see this as an open source project that has something of value to sell. And that's something of value is the tokens that we hold. Sure. Um, but sure. What, what happens though, Sam, once that fuel runs out, if that's your eco fuel, and let's say we're talking about, you know, longitudinally a decade down the track, when this methodology comes to an end, just as every yeah. scarce system does, what, what to do then? Are you building in something beyond the token? <laughs> that's called decentralization. Uh, I, it's, it's core to us, and we've been pretty clear about this from the beginning, that mm -hmm. eventually the RWE institutions themselves shouldn't need to exist. The community should run the network, um, and it should continue indefinitely without us. I mean, even now, we, we're only like six months in, but the network, we don't hash on the network at all. It's all the miners. They do all of it. We run um, 10, 15, 20 nodes, something like that, uh, that just allow people to join reliably and, and provide a gateway to people that don't have the decentralized access to the perma web through the web extension. Um, but yeah, already the community has taken over the running of that part. And we see them increasingly getting involved in the code base. Right. So, so we see one of the core parts of our job is actually handing off that responsibility and incentivizing the community correctly to take responsibility for it themselves and, and run the project. Right. Sam, can you think of any examples that have pre-existed or pre-dated now that are not necessarily in a, a, a blockchain or distributed ledger tech frame, such as Linux, for example. You know, there's true authentic open source uh, designs that have just flourished organically as time has gone on. Yeah, well, I, to me, Bitcoin is always the major one, right? Mm -hmm. Satoshi was around at the beginning. Mm -hmm. He was very, very important. He guided the process. And then over time, the, the community became self-sufficient and eventually he found himself unnecessary. And, and that, that is the core of decentralization. We should make ourselves unnecessary. If you are necessary to the ecosystem, you're a single point of failure. And that's sure. a problem. But I, I wanted to talk about the token in res with respect to now the goal to become an ultimate decentralized system. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's talk about how the token itself can uh, assume more of a greater sense of value. Is it based, we talked about this detachment. So as it becomes more distributed, as it becomes more global, is it also fair to say that's going, that utility is gonna be inherent in that 
globalization of the system and thus the token will increase in value from a utility perspective well i don't like to talk about whether the token will increase in value well i do because the community do too and i'm trying to understand what the likelihood of this will be from a from a mathematical standpoint Mm -hmm. i mean the the thing that interests me is that in the long term what we're going to do is build a a set of knowledge that, that can't be forgotten um, and it subsequently becomes valuable to humanity more largely. So if we get bits of history onto the system now, and this is what we've been doing with the Kerch Strait incident, actually, between Russia and Ukraine, we're storing the primary sources of this incident, the incident onto the RV permanently now. If you, you look back in 10 years' time uh, on this data, it'll be valuable. It'll be useful to have that, those primary uh, records of it. When you do that on a large enough scale, you get to the point where this becomes the central and reasonable place to store data for long periods of time. And that obviously increases the utility of the system in, you know, in general. Right. Uh, so I think that's a particularly interesting avenue. It's a very safe answer, Sam, but oh, I think I can read between the lines. Now let's talk about the raise you've already raised. You, we, mm-hmm. When I first spoke with you, you were about to do that. You're one of those rare um, startups where you quickly followed through with your becoming live and active in terms of yeah. uh, being, a, uh, how would you term it? Being, having a mainnet released. Yeah. So, a right. So you have a product that's active, but let's now talk about the bear market in that context. Did mm-hmm. you uh, approach it with that in mind? Or did you have enough capital to survive that and, and continue through as we're in this bear? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we don't see ourselves as currency speculators. So we converted much of our ETH way back at the beginning. Right. And this is just because you know, people gave us money for a product and, and we want to go and build the product. So I, I guess I'm conservative. Uh, I just think that, um, yeah, you should just make sure that we can do that. So, so we have enough runway. Uh, yeah, for a long while, yeah, that's fine. Mm-hmm. So you're confident that you have, you know, you say you've stored the acorns and you, you well and truly uh, can survive this winter. Yeah, absolutely. We're fine. Right. Okay. Now, what about partnerships, Sam? Obviously, there's you have a list on your website, but in terms of potential growth, expansion mm-hmm. of the ecosystem, are you looking at? Are you discussing anything with anyone at the moment? Yeah, all the time. Okay. So, this is something that I think is interesting in the blockchain space, and I, I, I don't really like the idea of a partnership per se. I think it's oh. too attached to this LOI partnership idea. That's really just a measure of intent that never leads to any. I meaning. totally agree. So talk yeah, us through what they, what you actually mean when you connect with these interested parties. What happens? Well, I mean, they're they're essentially customers of the network. Mm-hmm. That's the way that I I see them. Um, and it, and it's we kind of act as representatives of the network. I guess we we know its benefits and we can sell these to people. But, but critically, they're buying a service from the network, not from us. And they're not performing a partnership in the sense of we're working together to achieve one goal cooperatively. Really, they're just buying a service. And I think that's the way it should be. And I, I don't see enough of that in the blockchain space. I agree. So, so essentially, they're clients. So when you're speaking with these clients of the system, Sam, uh, are these large ent- uh, entities? Or can you give us some examples of the clients that are onboarding? Yeah, so there's some I obviously can't talk about yet because it's, you know. Yeah, I don't mind. Like I, I, you can talk about anything here, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, some larger, some smaller is basically the answer. Uh, and what's perhaps interesting is the, the amount of data they store, right? So, so when we get rid of this partnership sort of um, not really, yeah, when we get rid of that lens, it becomes a case of, okay, well, how much storage are they going to buy? And there, there are some smaller people that need a lot of data storage, and in comparison, some larger people that don't. So, for example, thinking back to this aerospace project, um, they need a large amount of storage in their network, and they also need to store quite a lot of uh, metadata onto the RV. So this, for the miners in the network, and again, now focuses on making the ecosystem strong, so it's important that that's very profitable for them. Um, yeah, this provides them with a uh, major source of revenue, I guess. And, and similarly, we're, we're working with a, um, oh, I can't even tell you the, the area because- Ah, uh, so guess. frustrating, Sam. We're, we're you can't tell me anything. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, that is something that, that's really interesting about the space at the moment that I'd like to uh, 
mm. get into. Well, Sam, you can't tell me anything, so I'm going to try and dig as much as I can. Are you really confident that you're going to have this ever-expanding opportunity to engage with more and more clients, given that you are a world leader in this kind of decentralized data, data storage and you're building out now the PermaWeb, are you really confident that this narrative, this discussion, this opportunity to really engage with significant and, and large clients is you know, going to become a practice for you? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it starts more with non-enterprises. I, I don't see that, that enterprises are going to start adopting this immediately. I, I think that's a... Mm-hmm. a what would you call it, a road not to take because it'll just mm-hmm. be too slow. So we start onboarding those people to use the, the sort of sub Um But there's, there's people running startups that need large amounts of data storage that's permanent. Um, yeah, the work is perfect clients for the network. And so that's what we're focusing on. As right. well as increasing the routes to, uh, to onboarding themselves as customers. So really, these things are kind of like funnels, right? Mm-hmm. You need to give people service and then you need to start getting people down the top of the funnel and eventually people will come out the bottom with applications that use the algorithm themselves. Right. So we see this as an automat- automated rather than manual business development. Makes sense. Think- yeah. In that respect though, uh, how are you spreading the word? Because obviously the client is going to really benefit, but how are you spreading the world word universally through your strategies, through your team to let people know you exist so that people can become aware, mm-hmm. they can experiment, they can develop and most importantly, be to potentially become a client if it suits them. Yeah, precisely. So the first thing we're doing is we're repositioning the, the website so that it's more, uh, well, it shows people a clear funnel that they can go down to get into the system. And then it's just a case of getting the, uh, the PR, really the press, uh, to spread the word around to people. And so I think because our system is quite unique and it offers something that you don't really get elsewhere, there's a lot of useful stories that can be told. So we're talking to people from you know, Coindesk and so on. Uh, yeah, about helping getting the, these messages across. Mm-hmm. Well, that's exciting because obviously now very few people in the world know of you. Um, are mm-hmm. you confident that in the next few years, Sam, through the processes that you're making that, that this is really going to change? Yeah, and I think hitting people outside of the crypto space, as we're doing with our web application storage mm-hmm. uh, plan, web application hosting plan, uh, is what's going to be key to that. So the one thing that blockchain has is that there's, there's a lot of blockchain projects that a lot of people in crypto know all about and nobody outside of crypto does because they don't offer anything valuable. Totally agree. So, so okay. making this system that, that makes it easy for people that don't have any crypto experience uh, to get a useful platform or product out of it uh, that, that solves a problem that they have better than solutions that already exist is key to that. And if we get like a tenth of reasonable growth for a startup in that area, uh, it will be doing amazingly for the blockchain space, which just really hasn't penetrated that at all. So essentially in that respect, usability is becoming really paramount in many, for many of the startups and you're really hitting that nail right on the head squarely because you're literally offering them an opportunity to do something. And I'm saying they as in developers around the world for anyone who wants to engage. This is so far beyond the crypto sphere and so far beyond the speculator now. This is when get things get real and get exciting because you have a genuine application that can expand beyond potential of, for the speculator to you know, make a quick buck as you grow in value. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, well, maybe in six months' time we come back and we talk about uh, IPFS incentivization. But that's, that's I'll, hold, I'll hold you to that as well because yeah, I think we're sure. talking a lot more at that point about web based applications now uh, just just to finish off sam obviously there's a lot of uh, concerns i suppose about uh, the performance generally of uh, startups since since you started i noticed that i had a look on the charts there's a decline initially for um, the way in which many projects are treated with regard to the, the pumping dumping that we see is commonplace are you concerned at all about that as you move towards the potential for exchanges no doubt you know about these and you're not going to tell me i'll still push for it but um, are you concerned that this could happen to you? Well, honestly, our approach is to focus on the long term at all times. Right? But I'm asking so, you about the short term, <laughs> respectfully. <laughs> uh, it, well, I mean, that's my answer. It, it's, mm. But I mean, I Sam, to, be, to be clearer, you have unlocked tokens. I understand yeah. for the most part that tends to lead towards the propensity for a bit of a dump. Um, have you put in place mechanisms to ensure that you know, it's not going to be too adverse for you. 
Yeah, I mean, there are people, our longer term backers, that are stepping in to provide floors for prices and so on. Right, okay. So we, yeah. But we, it sounds like you're not too worried because you're just so, long, so focused on that long term vision. Well, I mean, it's tough, right? Because we're a small group of people attempting to uh, deal with a very strange market. Right. Uh, but the way that the, you build something of value, I think, is you just have to keep focused. On, on what's going to be important in six, 12 months' time. You, you can't look at tomorrow so much if you're mm. in this position. It, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Sam, it's been an absolute privilege talking to you. I've learned more than I expected to, to be honest. Clearly, if you'd like to know more for all the people look, listening to Sam and wanting to know uh, where they can access information, there are certainly social media channels to do so. Sam, would you like to just inform the public of where they can go to get more information about our week? Yeah. So you can go to arweave.org and we're always posting blog posts at medium.com stroke at arweave, I think it is. Uh, or just, just search medium arweave, you'll find us. Same on Twitter, um, Facebook, all the rest of the usual channels. Just search for us and you'll find us. Absolutely. Well, Sam, as I said, as a quick recap, we've learned about PermaWeb. We've learned about, uh, very interestingly, this, this new browser, that, uh, this, this PermaWeb that you're really going to build out as an additional feature that perhaps no one really knew about as in terms of the, the key asset that it's going to bring for people beyond crypto. You're going to ensure that the, the fundamental the point of value is maintained, and that is that decentralized data storage system. You've got technology that is second to none, and you're also building at a world first in doing all of this. So congratulations to all the things you've done so far with your team. I'm really looking forward to having a conversation with you in the next few months to see how this plays out. Really excited to hear about how PermaWeb becomes uh, mainstream in the future. And until then, thank you again, and all the very best as you build out in this next, this next phase. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Absolutely. Thanks, Sam.